Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood. and pride. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's time. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder work. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There's power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the land. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the service for Jesus your King. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder work and power in the blood. We sing it, but folks, do we believe it? There is power in that blood. And folks, it's talking about power to set you free. Power to help you to do service for the Lord. Power to help you live the life that you need to live. And folks, this old song here talks about the life that we need to live. It's closer to Him. Let's let this be our prayer tonight. Let me live close to Thee. Praise God. In thy field I with wheels, sickles brave and true. In the fight for the right, I would dare and do. Spend my days in thy praise all the journey through. Let me live close to thee each day. Let me live close to thee. Take my hand, dear Lord, and guide me all along the rugged way. Don't let me lay close to Thee. Let me walk and talk with Thee, dear Lord, each day. Not the crown nor a noun that this world might see. I would work, never shirk, blessed Lord, for Thee. But to know where I go, that my soul is free. Let me live. To thee each day, let me be close to thee. Take my hand, dear Lord, and guide me all along the rugged way. Oh, let me be close to thee. Let me walk and talk with thee, dear Lord, each day. Help me bear and to share some poor pilgrim's love. Be my friend to the end of this toilsome road. I would sing to my King in the soul of all. Let me live close to Thee each day. Let me live close to Thee. Take my hand, dear Lord, and guide me all along the rugged way. Oh, let me live. Let 
blessing, Lord, for thee. But to know where I go, that my soul is free, let me live close to thee. There's another old chorus we used to sing. I hope Pastor remembers it. If me all in my lap keep me burning. Give me all in my lap, I pray. that's talking about you know what that oil is it's the Holy Ghost it's the Holy Spirit you know what we can do we can try to do a lot on our own but when it comes right down to it without God we're nothing and that's what scripture says and you know what without that oil of the Holy Spirit we ought to be praying for it every day Lord give me oil in my lamp you know what services like we had here this morning <laughs> comes when you have your lamp full of oil and it also it also has to do with those virgins you remember those virgins some had oil for their lamps and some didn't and you know the bad thing about it was when the bridegroom came the ones who didn't have oil what happened they didn't get to go in unto the marriage supper let's sing it one more time and let's sing it as a prayer tonight Give me all in my lamp, keep me burning. Give me all in my lamp, I pray. Give me all in my lamp, keep me burning. Keep me burning till the break of day. Come on and sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna to the King of Kings. a mountain that I've never faced before that's why I'm calling on you Lord I know it's been a while but Lord please hear my prayer I need you like I never have before Sometimes it takes a mountain Sometimes the trouble seems Sometimes it takes a desert To get a hold of me so much stronger 
than whatever troubles me. Sometimes it takes a mountain to trust you and believe. faced a mountain like I never faced before that's why I'm calling on you Lord I know it's been a while but Lord please hear my prayer I need you like I never have before sometimes it takes a mountain sometimes a troubled sea sometimes it takes a desert to get a hold of me your love is so much stronger
is and whatever troubles me sometimes it takes a mountain to trust you and believe your love is so much stronger your love is so much stronger than whatever troubles me. Sometimes it takes a mountain to trust you and believe. Sing that one more time. Your love is so much stronger. Your love is so much stronger than whatever troubles me. Sometimes it takes a mountain to trust you and believe. Hallelujah. Can you give the Lord a hand clap and a shout of praise? He is worthy. I love the promises that we read in the Word of God, especially the promises that He promises to answer prayer. Regardless of what we're facing, regardless of what we're going through, we can call upon Him. His Word says, Call unto me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. What a thought to know that when we pray, God answers he hears our prayer, and he understands, and he sees, and he hears, and he will answer. We have many needs that we've been praying for, and, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, our prayer list is full of names of uh, individuals connected uh, to our church family. But there are other needs that uh, we need to pray about, and one special need that we're going to pray about tonight is concerning... Uh, the situation that's taking place in Israel. Uh, we have Assembly of God missionaries that are in Israel, uh, and they are there as we speak tonight, and they are in the midst of all of this conflict that's going on. One of our Assemblies of God missionaries that is in Israel, he and his wife and children have re reached out to our pastors here in the United States and I want to share with you this letter from our missionary family in Israel and uh, to let you know what life is like there on the front lines of the mission field, especially when a war is taking place in their area. And for their safety and protection, I will withhold their name because of our internet broadcast. Our missionary writes, Dear friends, Thank you for your continued prayers for our safety and for our ministry here in Israel. We have been overwhelmed with the amount of texts, emails, and messages from you, and we apologize for not being able to respond timely to each one. We wanted to provide another quick update, and we will continue to update if there were any significant changes on our end. While we spend a lot of time earlier this week Keeping up with the news, we quickly grew weary of this and realized this was not healthy for our family or our mental well-being. We have weaned off the perpetual news as much as we can, but staying in tune as much as needed to maintain a safe awareness. The children have not returned to school. Schools throughout the country will again be closed for the coming week and indefinitely. But classes will resume beginning Sunday via distance learning. Essentially, our children will be on Zoom calls daily with their teachers and classmates. None of our kids are excited about this, so this can be a point of prayer as you pray for our daughters. The kids' sporting activities have been unpredictable this week. Some after-school activities have been canceled altogether and indefinitely. Twice this week, however, as practices were just beginning, they were immediately cut short by the sounds of sirens and explosions and orders to take shelter. Our daughters seem to be doing okay overall, but they would say that they are worried and a little bit scared. We are in a constant state of tension and balance between wisdom and boldness, between safety and courage, between ministry and family, between being informed and being full of faith. As we make intentional efforts to spend time with our Israeli friends, we also recognize the need to be extra intentional 
to relax and have meaningful family time right now. We know we are called to be peacemakers even in the midst of war in this land. We want our home to be a peaceful one, respite for our children, and we also want uh, to be a beacon of hope within our neighborhood. Here are some specific ways you can pray for us. Pray for our daughters, for their mental and emotional peace. School disruption. School is closed indefinitely, and they have transitioned to distance learning. They have limited time with friends due to the school disruption and reluctance of parents to send their children out to play. Pray for our family. Balancing, parenting, comforting our kids and family time with ministry and time spent with friends. Pray for our local friends that the comfort, grief, and fear of the situation would cause them to seek God and engage with us in spiritual conversions. Pray for the local believers and the local churches. There are believers throughout Israel, even with Gaza, that God gives churches opportunity to share the gospel as they attempt to meet needs in impacted communities. Pray for wisdom, knowing how to best spend our time and resources, knowing when to hunker down and pray and when to courageously be out as witnesses, when to stay and when to go. Pray for our team as we have assemblies of God workers throughout this land. How can pray that we can be effective tools to be used of the Lord during this time? We are grateful for your prayers. And these are from missionaries, Assemblies of God missionaries in Israel. Church, can we stand all across the sanctuary? And can we lift our hands toward heaven? And can we intercede into the throne room of heaven for our missionaries that are serving in Israel? And let's pray that God would bring peace in that land and in that nation. Father, we come before your presence tonight in the name of Jesus. Lord, your word instructs us that we should pray for the peace of Israel, the peace of Jerusalem. Lord, we understand there is conflict. There is a war that is taking place, Lord. It is a war between the forces of righteousness and evil. And Father, we know that your word has already declared that you will build your church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And Lord, we lift up this missionary family to you. Father, we pray for your hedge of protection, for your anointing, for your power. God, that you would give them strength and endurance, Lord, to take a stand for you in the midst of the, uh, of the onslaught of this war. God, that you would be with them, that you would shelter them, Lord, with your hand of protection. God, that you would use this circumstance, Lord, to bring about a mighty revival in the land of Israel, that these Jewish people would hear the truth of the word of God, that they would see the truth demonstrated before their very eyes. Lord, that miracles, signs, and wonders uh, would take place, Lord, by the power and the anointing of your spirit Lord uh, Father we know Lord with you all things are possible that you are the source of our strength you are the strength of our life uh, and Father we lift them up to you Lord uh, that you would strengthen them that you would shield them from the snare of the enemy God we thank you for what you are doing in Israel and we thank you for what you are going to do may your power be demonstrated we pray and ask in Jesus name and everyone said amen Amen. If you can remain standing this evening for the reading of the Word of God, and if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I'm going to be uh, preaching or teaching or as some call it, preaching tonight. A, uh, we're going to begin a study of the Gospel of John. And if you want to uh, have an outline to go by, then I encourage you to create one because I did not make one for you. But I will try to go as slow as possible so you can catch the points and you can take some notes. But uh, tonight we're going to begin in John chapter 1 and we will read the first five verses. The Bible says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. This evening, for just a few minutes, I want to preach to you on the subject, and I'm calling the title to this message, The Light That Shines Forever. The light that 
that shines forever. Can you one more time lift your hands and let's pray for his blessing and anointing on this message. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for every promise in your word. Lord, that you were the word in the beginning, that you were the word of God that became flesh and dwelt among us, that the light of the glory of God has been shining throughout eternity and still shines today. Father, in this message, let our hearts be receptive. Let our minds be alert as we receive from your message, your message of truth, your message of hope, your message, God, that is anointed of you. And, Father, we give you praise in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. You may be seated. In these first few verses of the first chapter of John, the Bible is talking about the Word of God that is the light of this world. And looking at these first five verses, it is important that we understand the message of what John is writing about. We see that in the beginning, there was the Word. Word is capitalized. There is something special about this word that was there in the beginning. This is the word that was with God. It is the word that was God. This word existed in the beginning with God. And we know that in the very beginning that God created everything through his word. Nothing was created except through the word of God. And so this is the word that gave life to everything that was created. And the life of this word is what brought light to everyone in this world. This light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish this light. And when we read John chapter 1, we are looking at a description of an individual that the Bible is referring to as the word. That in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And it was because of the this word that creation took place. Nothing was created without this word. Life came into existence because of the word. And because of this word, there is life and there is light. The light from this word is an amazing light. It is a light that is like none other in this universe. We see the light for the first time in the first chapter of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, the Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. This light is an amazing light because the light that is mentioned in the first part of the Gospel of John and the light that is talked about in the first few verses of the book of Genesis, uh, this light does not come from the sun nor the moon uh, or the stars. Uh, Those Uh, light-giving sources were not created until Genesis chapter 1, verse 14 and 18. There the Bible says, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So when we're looking at Genesis chapter 1 and we're looking at John, John chapter 1. What is this light that is found in the Word of God? This light comes from the Word. The Word of God. That means it's important. It's a proper name. The Word that was with God. The Word that was God. The Word that brought life to everything that was created by God. This light word was the life and the life was the light of mankind it is the word of God that is shining about the glory of God and this light that comes from the glory of God is brighter than any life that you can possibly imagine God created this world he created everything within it he created the animals he created the birds in the air He created the fish in the sea. He created the grass, the mountains, the valleys, the oceans, the streams, the deserts, the trees, and the flowers. He created the sun, moon, and the stars. But one part of God's creation was very special. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 27, 
God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image and the image of God created he, him, male and female. In Genesis 2 verse 7, the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. When God created humanity, this brings a shift in the creation. It brings a, a shift in, in the way things took place in this universe. God created mankind in a perfect state. He created humanity in his image and likeness. They were made by God. They were made for God. They were made to worship God. And the glory of God was filling this entire earth. But something began to happen. Something began to change within the creation of God. Sin entered into this world because of the disobedience of mankind. Now I want you to think about something that I find very interesting. There is a difference between hot and cold, and there is a difference between light and darkness. Darkness is nothing. All darkness is, is the absence of light. Cold is nothing. Cold is just the absence of heat. So in this perfect world that God had created, he created everything perfectly, and the light of the glory of God shone forth across everything in this universe, and everything was perfect. But then darkness came. What happened? The light was being hindered. Not that the light was stopped. God is eternal. His light has no end. His glory has no end. Yesterday, how many of you were able to see the eclipse? It, it was cloudy in the River Valley. We were, most of us were unable to see it. I just know that around 11 to 12 o'clock, it was getting a little bit darker, and I just thought it was just dark clouds, but it never rained. It was the eclipse that was taking place. The light of the sun was being blocked. Other parts of our nation experienced more darkness than we did in this region. The sun never stopped shining but the light was being blocked. Although the sun was shining, the sun was giving its light, there was an obstacle that came between us and the source of the light as the moon began to pass between the earth and the sun, blocking the light from the sun reaching our planet. It's the same way with the glory of God. The glory of God has always been shining. His glory has been shining around this world. The light of God was shining, but the darkness was uh, obstructed. The light was obstructed by sin and it was creating darkness around this world. The evil forces of this world, the darkness was not comprehending the glory of the light of God. The glory of God was everywhere, but the spirit of sin was would not listen the spirit of rebellion was at work in this world the bible tells us in genesis chapter 6 verse 5 through 6 that god saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually and it repented the lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart so we see that in the beginning god created this world and everything within it the glory of God covered this entire world as the waters cover the sea. But sin had entered into this world. The wickedness of mankind began to grow very dark around this world. The light of God was shining in the darkness, but the darkness would not comprehend the glory of God. The darkness uh, would not comprehend the light of God, uh, but the darkness could not extinguish that light. Amen. Did you hear what I said? Although the light was shining in the darkness and the darkness was not understanding, the darkness was not comprehending, the darkness was not receiving, but at the same time, the darkness, in other words, the power of sin could not extinguish the light of God's glory. There was something that had to be done. What was going to happen to God's people? Because out of all of the awesome creation that God had made in this universe, he created people in his own image. He created people to worship him. People were created by God to have dominion and power and authority over everything in this world. But because of sin, an evil curse had fallen upon this entire world. When you look at John chapter 1, let's read it in a different perspective. In the beginning was the Word. 
The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Everything was perfect until this point in time. But then verse 5 says, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. What was in store for God's people now? The people of God had sinned, they had rebelled, and now they're doing things of their own choice. They're, they're, they're living against the will of God. The light of the glory of God is shining, but no one is paying attention. Nobody is listening. Nobody seems to care. The glory of God is there, but the darkness of sin, the darkness of the sinful nature of humanity is not comprehending the glory of God. So God had to deal with the wickedness of this world. In Genesis chapter 6, Verse 5 through 8, the Bible says that God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will, re I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God was dealing with the people in Noah's day. And God had made a plan to redeem his people. He was going to send a flood to destroy this earth. And Noah preached the message of the judgment of God. But only Noah and his family survived this flood. They were the only ones that entered into this ark. 2,000 years ago when Jesus came into this world, born in Bethlehem, the world was in a wicked condition. People were still not comprehending the light of the glory of God. And even today in the 21st century, uh, more than ever before, people are still not comprehending the light of the glory of God. And there is wickedness everywhere that you look. You turn on the television, you look in the newspaper, you're, you're on the internet and you see everywhere that you look today, it's wickedness can continually around this world you see sin makes God very angry sin and wickedness breaks God's heart and causes agony in the heart of God because it is sin that caused Jesus Christ to have to suffer and die on the cross of Calvary in Romans chapter 1 verse 18 through 32 the Bible talks about the wrath of God now, there's a subject you don't hear talked about in church as much today, the wrath of God. And a lot of these protests that I've seen of people trying to come out against the message of the church, and they're calling the church a bunch of haters because we preach against homosexuality, that it is a sin, that homosexuality will send people to hell, that there's no such thing as same-sex marriage. It's from the, the abomination. It's from the pits of hell. But yet they say that God is a God of love and that we need to be able to love whoever we choose and, and that God does not condemn. Well, they're right. God does not condemn. And John 3, verse 17, it says, For God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God didn't come into this world to condemn the world. Do you know why? Because the world was already condemned. We were born condemned. We were born in sin because John 3, verse 18 says, He that believeth not on the Son of the living God is condemned already because he is not believed in the only begotten Son of God. They're condemned because they never believed. But in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 32, the Bible says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed four -footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness 
through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who was blessed forever. Amen. What we see taking place here is that God was abandoning His people. It's not because He did not care. It's not because He no longer loved them, but it's because they had abandoned Him. They had quit worshiping Him. They had quit honoring Him. They were rebelling against the Word of God. They were disobedient to His Word. And so God was basically letting them go. He was withdrawing His presence from them. And we see a similar situation in Exodus chapter 32 and chapter 33. The children of Israel had turned their back upon God and, and God was ready to consume them. He was ready to destroy them. And that was when Moses began to pray and he said, God, if your presence does not go before us, uh, then we do not want to go. Moses understood uh, that without the presence of God, they were not going to make it. Uh, they needed God to go with them. They needed God to go before them because God is the source of our strength. He's the strength of our life that he's going to go before us. He's going to prepare the way before us uh, and we must follow him for he is the way uh, and if he is not there there's no need in us even trying to go because we're not going to make it on our own strength uh, I don't even want to try to make it on my own strength because I know that I'm going to fail without him but if his presence goes before me I know everything's going to be alright uh, if his presence is there uh, there's going to be victory uh, there's going to be joy uh, there's going to be power uh, there's going to be healing. There's going to be life. Why? Because the presence of God is there. But in Romans chapter 1, sin had increased. The people had become so wicked that God was to the point of just letting them go. In a sense, this is the situation that was taking place with the people in Israel. It's the same situation in which the Apostle Paul is referring to in Romans chapter 1. And I believe that here today, in the year 2023, we are facing a very similar situation, if not worse today. People are doing their own thing. They are not living according to the Word of God. They have no respect for authority. They have no respect for God, no respect for the Word of God. They're becoming perverse in their thinking. Their lifestyle is as if God is saying that I'm tired of you trying to get, uh, I, I'm tired of trying to get you to see the truth. I'm tired of trying to get your attention. He said you've rejected the truth over and over. And so God lets them go. He lets them go and do whatever they are destined to do and, and they will spend eternity in hell. That's why in Romans 1 verse 24, Paul writes that God gave them up. In other words, his presence abandoned them. He goes on to say in verse 26, For this cause God gave them up and vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust, one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meet. Let me stop right there for just a second and say this. As you look at what's taking place in American athletics, and you see men that have become sissies and cowards, and unable to compete in an athletic program that's designed especially for them and for their biological anatomy. And so they think that they need to re-identify themselves and reassign themselves to the opposite sex. And they think that they can become a woman and compete in women's sporting events and then go from being at the bottom of the scoreboard to being up at the top of the scoreboard. That is not only perverted, it is not only insane, but it is also cheating, and they need to be disqualified, and we need to get back to the basics of how things are done. If you're born as a male, you're going to live life as a male. You're going to die as a male. If you're born as a female, you're going to live as a female. You know, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood had it right back in the 1980s. He said little boys were will grow up to become men. Little girls will grow up to become ladies. Uh, and there's nothing you or anybody else can do that will change the reality of that fact of life. 
But the Bible says that in the last days, we're going to see this taking place. It was taking place in Paul's time, and we see it taking place today. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. It was a desperate situation. We're facing a desperate situation today. The light of the glory of God is shining in the darkness, and at the same time, the darkness is not comprehending the light. We're facing it today. The glory of God is shining in this world. Preachers are preaching the word of God. Churches are shining the light with the love of God. Christians are reaching out to be a witness to this world, but the world is not being receptive. The world wants no part of the light of the glory of God. They may try to stop us. They may try to silence us, but listen, church, they cannot stop the light of the glory of God from shining forth in this dark and troubled world because Jesus said over two thousand years ago upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it and I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven the light of the glory of God will shine forth so God had a solution to the problem in this world God was going to send a preacher that's important. They needed a preacher. Every church needs a preacher. They need a pastor. Every congregation needs a pastor. I'm afraid in today's generation that word is being overused. I was at a minister's conference last week, and I've known about this, but it was kind of brought into a different reality to me. You can find a church that has all kinds of pastors they have executive pastor administrative pastor facilities pastor they have a home care pastor family care pastor counseling pastor I'm the, how many pastors can you have and then it dawned on me they're not pastors they're just administrators a pastor is a leader a shepherd of a congregation. Now here at Howe Assembly of God, I'm the pastor of this church. I'm the shepherd of this church collectively. But within this church family, we have three other pastors. Brother Kenny Matlock is our associate pastor who when I am not here, he takes the reins, so to speak, as he did last Sunday night and as he does on Wednesday nights, and he preaches and teaches the Word of God. And, and if you missed Wednesday night's service, you need to go online and watch it. That's one of the best messages I've heard him preach, talking about, I will do a new thing. Brother Kenny's our associate pastor. His wife, Sister Carla, she's our youth pastor. There were circumstances that she deals with concerning our young people that some of them I don't even know about but they have confidence in her because she's the one that teaches them and counsels them and so when they have a problem they go and talk to sister Carla because to them she is their pastor sister Shelley is our children's pastor she knows things about children that we deal with here at church that I may never know about but because she's their teacher and she instructs them, they come to her and they talk to her and she can give them counsel and they confide in her. Why? Because to these boys and girls, she's their pastor. See, pastors are important because pastors point us into the right direction. Pastors give us accountability. So do I have somebody I'm accountable to? You better believe it. 
as a cooperative fellowship in the assemblies of God. I have a pastor that leads me, that guides me. There are ministers that I call and talk to and, and receive guidance and counsel from. We have our, our presbyters. We have our, our district superintendent, Brother uh, Daryl Wooten in Oklahoma City. He is our pastor. And, 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 and it amazed me one day when he found out that our church was debt-free. He called me and, on the phone and congratulated me. And, and I was like wondering, how did you get my phone number? I never even talked to you before. But, but he got my number and he called me. And he was proud of what was taking place here at Howe Assembly. But God was going to send a preacher. Something had to be done. You see, the world was not obeying the truth of God's word, and because they were not adhering to the light of the glory of God, something had to be done. So God was sending a preacher. He sends a messenger to preach the word. He sends somebody who will shine forth the light, somebody who will carry the light, somebody that will carry the message. In John chapter 1, verse 6 through 8, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That's what a pastor does. That's what a preacher does. The light of the glory of God. It's like a burning torch. And we pick up that torch. And we begin to carry this torch everywhere that we go. And we proclaim the word of God. To people that we meet. We proclaim the word of God in our churches. We proclaim the word of God evangelistically. See, John was not the light, as the scripture says, but he was sent by God to be a witness of this light. He was sent by God to be a witness of Jesus Christ. See, John was a preacher. There are biblical requirements in order to be a preacher, and although these requirements are not specifically recorded until after the death of John the Baptist, John still met the requirement that was set forth in the Word of God on who could be a preacher. First of all, a preacher has to be someone who was sent by God. In John chapter 1, the Bible says there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Think about the disciples of Jesus Christ. They were men who were sent by God. They were sent by Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, Jonah. In the Old Testament was a man who was sent by God. The Apostle Paul was sent by God. Isaiah was sent by God. Moses was sent by God. A preacher is sent by God. And the Bible also uses the phrase called of God. I talked to a man this week. He used to pastor a church uh, in Arkansas. I'm not going to tell you the name of the church because I don't want to embarrass anyone. But for many years, I had great respect for him and appreciated his lifestyle and testimony and ministry. But I was talking to him Friday. He came in my office, and we were talking, and I asked him, I said, are you, are you still preaching? Are you still pastoring? He said, no, sir. I just couldn't do that anymore. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I tried pastoring for about a year, and it went for me. He said, that's something you've got to be called by God to do. And, and I'm thinking, you know, the calling of God is without repentance. And if God has called us to preach the message of the gospel, we need to preach this message whether we feel like it or not, whether it's easy or not. And he was telling me about all the problems he was facing as a pastor and the, the, the persecution that he faced and the trouble that he experienced in churches. And I, I'm thinking, you know, sometimes it's just like riding a horse. Just because you may be a, a cowboy, it doesn't mean that you're never going to get thrown off a horse. I'm sure Brother Kenny can testify that even though he's a professional cowboy, I'm sure he still had his share of getting bucked off. I know here a while back he had an incident with a bull. But what do you do? You get up, you dust yourself off, and you keep on going. We don't give, just because life gets difficult, just because uh, you, you run into a bump here and there, doesn't mean that you throw in the towel and give up and quit and say, well, I guess I just wasn't called to do this. You know, if, if I quit the ministry the first time I got offended by somebody, I would have quit probably 25 years ago. 
Because the first time you tell somebody about Jesus, sometimes you may get spit upon, sometimes you may get slapped in the face. Since I didn't preach the message this morning, I can share part of it tonight. It was about 15 years ago. I was preaching at a church. And after the service, it was on a Friday night, and it was an outreach service. I had preached a message, and after the service, we were giving out groceries. And a man came by, and I was greeting people as people were leaving, as I do here, you know, shaking hands with everybody. And I went to shake my hand, or I went to shake his hand, and uh, he just looked at me and said, I'm not shaking your hand. And I was like, okay. He's like, I just came here for the free groceries, and then I'm getting out of here. Of course, he said a few other words along with that. And then he went on to tell me how racist he thought me and the church were. And he started telling me how unbiblical we were and, and how much we were uh, being racist toward people. And I thought, you know, in this worship center, we've got uh, Hispanics, we've got Asians, we've got blacks, we've got whites, we've got Indians. We had every nationality that you could think of in Fort Smith, and they were all there. And I'm thinking, you know, he must like us a little bit. I mean, he did come to get some free food. But, you know, we're called by God to shine the light of the glory of God, to shine the light of the gospel message into this darkness. Sometimes you're going to be met with some bold darkness. Sometimes you're going to be met with some darkness that wants nothing to do with you. The Bible tells us that we're called by God, we're sent by God. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 7, the Bible gives a description on who a preacher is. John the Baptist fits this description. The Bible says, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. He's the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, no, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. In other words, they've got their life together. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. A preacher is to be a witness of the light. In John chapter 1, verse 8, it says that John was sent to bear witness of the light. The light is Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. In Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, Jesus told the disciples, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That's what John was going to do. That's what the disciples were going to do. They were a witness for Jesus Christ. They were preparing the way for the Lord. And John was going to tell people how to find salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. You see, that's the job of a preacher. And today in this world, more than ever before, we need some people, some men and women uh, who are sent by God, who were called by God uh, that will stand up against sin, uh, stand up against unrighteousness, Righteousness. Uh, stand up and declare the message of the Word of God uh, through the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost. You see, the job of a pastor, of a preacher, uh, of an evangelist, of someone who was sent by God and called by God, their job, their mission uh, is to proclaim the Word of God uh, so that through the teaching of the Word of God uh, that people will come to know the truth of His Word uh, and know about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. So when we're looking at John chapter 1, verse 1 through 9, let me read this again. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him is not anything made that was made. In Him was life, the life was the light of men. 
and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. See, in the very beginning, the all-powerful, personal God created this universe and everything within it. God created humanity and his own image to live joyfully in his presence and humble submission to his gracious authority. But people rebelled. Man rebelled against God. And in consequence, there is a punishment. There is a price to be paid. Physical death. It's the wrath of God. But in the midst of that darkness, in the midst of that sin, in the midst of that punishment for sin, the Bible describes the plan of deliverance, which began with his choosing a nation of Israel to display his glory in a fallen world. The Bible describes to us how God acted mightily upon Israel's behalf and rescued them from slavery and then giving them his law. But God's people, like all of us, failed to reflect the glory of God. They failed to submit to God's authority. And then in the fullness of time, Jesus Christ, God himself, Emmanuel, God with us, he came into this world to renew this world and to restore his people. Jesus obeyed the law that was given to Israel. He fulfilled the law. And, and although he was innocent, although he was completely without sin, he suffered the consequences of the rebellion of humanity when he suffered and died on the cross of Calvary. Three days later, the Word of God declares that God raised him from the dead. And today, 2,000 years later, the church of Jesus Christ has been commissioned. We have been called by God. We have been sent by God to take the good news of Jesus Christ to this world. You know what that means, church? That means we are a carrier of the light. We are to carry the torch of the gospel. We are to carry the flame of the Word of God. And we cannot do that by ourselves. But we must be empowered by his anointing. We must be empowered by his spirit to call people everywhere to repent of their sin and to trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You see, repentance and faith is what restores our fellowship with God and it results in a lifestyle of ongoing transformation. The Bible promises that one day Jesus Christ is going to return to this earth He's going to rule and reign as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But only those who have lived a life of repentance, who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and personal Savior, they will escape the, the judgment of God, they will escape the wrath of God, and they will live in the presence of God throughout all eternity. But God's message to people today is the same to every one of us, to repent to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ before it's too late. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, that we will be saved. And when we have taken on the name of Jesus and we've confessed our sins before him and turned from our wicked ways, and Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of our life, his light is in our life. And we can carry that light. We can carry that message to others that we meet. We can shine the light of the glory of God so that others can see that light and know who Jesus is. And we can proclaim the word of God so people will hear his word and know the truth. And that truth can set them free. Why? Because this is the light of God that shines forever. Can we stand together across this sanctuary? Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight, Lord, for your glory that shines around this world. For, Lord, in your name there is power, Jesus. And, Lord, we thank you for that light that you have given us. We thank you, Lord, that you are the source of our strength. You are the strength of our life, Jesus. That regardless of what we face, regardless of what we're going through, God, that we can call upon you. And that in the midst of a dark and troubled world, your light is still shining. Your glory is still shining. 
And, Lord, help us, Lord, to be a carrier of that line. Help us, Lord, to carry the message of the Word of God, to be a vessel that you can use to build your kingdom so that lives would be changed, that people would be set free by the power of your Spirit. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. All across the sanctuary, I want to challenge you tonight to be a carrier of the glory of God, to be a carrier of the gospel message. You may say, well, I'm not a pastor. No, but you're a child of God. That's all that is required. You don't have to have a Bible college degree. You don't have to have a credential behind your name. If you have the blood of Jesus in your life, then you can be a witness for Jesus Christ. So I will encourage us, let's come together around this front and let's find a place and let's open up our heart unto Him and say, God, would you empower me to carry your message? Would you empower me to be a witness? Would you empower me to carry the light of the gospel message of Jesus Christ? We see the things that's taking place in this world and we know that it's just a matter of time before Jesus Christ returns for his church. And what we do for him, we must do very quickly. For he is coming soon. And on that day, every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So whatever you need tonight, it's found at an altar of prayer. God is able to meet your need. He's able to meet the need in your life. He's able to meet the need in your family. He's able to meet the need for this community, for this church family. He's all powerful. And he is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. We thank you, Jesus.